Hi, I'm Carla Robbins. I'm the faculty director for the Masters in International Affairs program. And I know a lot of you, but not all of you. And I'm so glad you guys are here, but I'm not surprised you're here because uh, Marnie and Suzanne have put together an extraordinary panel and we're really lucky to have just this range of people from the NGO and the IGO and the private sector here um, to talk about what they do. You know, the title of this panel is Navigating a Global Career, but it's really, boy, you guys have a cool job and how can I grow up and have a job like you is the way I <laughs> sort of think about this discussion. And I know that it's very rarely linear because people always ask me that about my job in journalism. I mean, how did you grow up and get that job? And it's not linear. I mean, I didn't even get my first job in journalism until I was 29. So I don't expect, if you guys always knew what you were gonna do, I'm gonna get depressed. So, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna start, you guys have their full bios there, and you can go on the web and probably get even fuller bios. So I'm just gonna do a very quick overview. Um, Carlos Peterson does country risk analysis for Latin America at the Eurasia Group. He's also worked in consulting in Mexico City and as, advis as an advisor to Mexico's energy minister. And you have an MPA from some school uptown. Exactly. We don't talk about that. <laughs> Nora Marin is a policy analyst in the policy and strategic partnerships at the United Nations Development Program. She's also worked with the World Bank in Bangladesh and in BRAC in Bangladesh, and she holds a master's in development economics from SOAS at the University of London. Um, Daniel Coughlin is the deputy director of technology for programs at the International Rescue Committee, and he comes out of the tech world, but he also has a degree focused on global affairs and media studies from the New School. And Olivia Night Nightingale, hi Olivia, all the way down there, <laughs> um, was a program associate in civil and political rights and humanitarian response for the American Jewish World Services. And before that, she was at the International Crisis Group. If you don't know ICG, I really recommend any you doing any sort of area studies. I'm, I'm a big, I'm a fan of all of these things, but ICG is probably not as well known. Um, I recommend you guys look at their website. And she too has an MA in Global Affairs from another school downtown, <laughs> uh, from NYU. And I forgive all of you for not coming here because we are new. So, so I want to thank you all for coming. And I want to start by asking each of you the same question, and I'm not going to do that after that because I want to have a conversation. But um, can you sum up just in two sentences what does your organization do? I'm really loud. <laughs> what does your organization do, and what do you do for your organization? So, who wants, to, Carlos, you want to start first? Sure. So, I work at Eurasia Group, which is a political risk consultancy firm, and basically, I'm the Mexico analyst and part of the Latin America team advising private companies on political risk. So, what is a political risk? Who hires you? So our clients are basically private companies that are investing globally. Um, our company covers over 90 countries around the world. And what we try to advise them is how risk might affect their investments, either because they want to enter a new market, because they're already investing there, because they have activities in different parts of the country, or just because geopolitics overall might affect them. Uh, we try to make sense of that in, in, in order to, to, to improve their business. So do they call you at 2 in the morning because they're panicked because something <laughs> happened, or do you do regular reports for them, or...? It is, it is a mixed bag. The 2 a.m., I haven't got that yet. <laughs> at, at least calls, emails, yes. Um, and it's, it's, it's regular reports that we write upon the things that are happening or, or will happen, uh, always with a forward-looking view on what we are analyzing. If an election is coming, we have to tell our clients what we expect to happen, even if we are not obviously absolutely sure. Uh, and then we have a, a very direct engagement with them. We are constantly on the phone, we're constantly meetings. I just came back from Los Angeles this morning on a road show to see some clients over there. So it's a const constant interaction, which is actually one of the greatest parts of my job, like to really get in front of my clients and talk to them. Because most of them have, a, or a lot of them have a really deep understanding of what's going on in Latin America, in Mexico, so they challenge your views and they make it interesting to, to, to not just like, give a speech on what you're thinking about politics there, but also like to challenge what you're thinking about. Oh, that's right. so, you know, we, one of our concentrations is Western Hemisphere Affairs here, so we have a lot of students studying that here. So Nora, what do you do? 
Hi there. Please let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, usually I'm told I'm not loud enough for the room. <laughs> so I work for the United Nations Development Program, um, and just like uh, every other agency of the UN, we focus on all the sustainable development goals, and I think that distinguishes us from the rest of the UN agencies is that we do not have a particular focus on one of the SDGs. So we work with, uh, with the sustainable development goals, and the department I work for is... Um, Around 40 years old, we work in international development cooperation, and the particular framework that we try and promote is the South-South Cooperation Framework. Um, essentially, I mean, in the course of the discussion, I hope to uh, go into deeper uh, discussions on this. Essentially, what we do is we work with developing countries in particular, and we try and um, address some of the criticisms of North-South collaboration and the whole dependency that developing countries had on develop, developed countries for aid and donations. Uh, our approach to development cooperation is um, based on the changing landscapes and the recognition that developing countries have a lot to share in terms of technical know-hows, technical exchanges, knowledge sharing. And we basically work as a mediating body um, to, for example, link an African government to a South Asian country, for example. Um, yeah. In a nutshell, that's what I do for a living right now. So, Mr. Tech Guy, how come you're in the, in the how come you're in the public sector when you could be making all that money working for Amazon? <laughs> um, so that's a long story. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But just to just by way of introduction, um, so the International Rescue Committee is an international uh, NGO uh, that does um, humanitarian. Uh, work uh, throughout the world and uh, refugee resettlement in the United States. Um, I work in the IT department um, as basically a deputy director for um, uh, our Technology for Programs initiative, which is using technology to support our interventions in the various social sectors that we work in. So the example would be um, if we're doing a mobile health uh, program, then the mobile health technology that's deployed to a tablet or to a mobile phone would be something that I would be responsible for designing or deploying or supporting in one way or another. Um, that sounds very yeah. cool. Hi, uh, I'm Olivia. Um, so I work at American Jewish World Service, which is uh, a human rights organization. We um, provide grants to small grassroots organizations in 19 countries all over the world, um, focused on sexual health and rights, land, water, and climate justice, civil and political rights, and humanitarian response. Um, so within that, I uh, work specifically with the civil and political rights and humanitarian response portfolios, doing everything from producing the grants that get sent to our board for approval, to developing strategies for both civil and political rights and humanitarian response, to traveling to the countries that we work in to identify new partners for us to support. Um, so really a, a whole host of things. Wow, those are all really cool jobs. So um, you all have great educations. So can you, when you look on it and you studied in part to get here, can you say there are things that you studied that got you here or was it a previous job that got you to this? Was it an internship? What's sort of the path that got you into this um, since nothing is linear in life? <laughs> so, I studied here in New York in the school north of the city, um, and for me it was, from an interest perspective, it was, it was actually quite linear to what I'm doing to what I was doing before. Sorry to, to disappoint you. <laughs> uh, I was doing also public policy consultancy in Mexico, a little bit different, working more with government, uh, uh, local and federal. but always related to public affairs. And then I came here to study my master's, uh, attempting to have a deeper specialization on political analysis, but also combining it with more of an econ, international affairs kind of background. Uh, I am a political scientist by education from college in Mexico, and, and, and because of my background and because of my uh, degree, I already had a, a fairly strong political analysis uh, uh, background before I came here, and actually what SIPA 
was able to give me was this other side of it, the international, financial, economic side of the equation that actually was something that I would have not been able to, 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 to combine with. Uh, so sorry, to, to get the job that I have, I, would, I, I re do you really need those skills? Why? Because on political risk and working for the private sector, basically your clients don't want to listen to your opinions on who you think just is going to win, but what that might do to the economy, what might that do to uh, financial assets. So they want to see how the impact might be related to them. And, and, and this, so this, this in between, between the private and public sector, between economics and uh, political science was, was a, a great combination for me. And in addition to that, I think that what helped me get this job was, and I think it was greatly important, was my internship. I uh, did an internship for my second year of my master's, the two semesters at Medley Global Advisors, which is another political risk consultancy firm here in New York. And uh, I think for two reasons it helped me get the current job that I have. One is more expertise on the sector and, and an advantage to the people that were applying to the position that I now have. And secondly, and something that I think you are in a great position, which is being in New York. Uh, if you want to work in the political risk arena, there are just, it's, it's a very small sector, a very niche sector, and there are like very few companies that do that. So being in New York or DC, I think are the two places, maybe London, are the three places where you can find more of these companies and being close to those companies allows you to tap into those doors, meet people, have these internship opportunities and then open doors to do uh, what you do. Yeah. So what courses, what courses did you take that helped you bridge the world between political science and the private sector, and particularly finance and economics? Sure. Um, there was one that was especially good, it was called Emerging Capital Markets, and it was a pretty historical class that went through whole the, the, the several financial crises of the world, starting with the 1982 financial crisis and the uh, the lost decade of Latin America and then the tequila crisis in Mexico and the 1998 crisis in, in, in the Southeast Asia and then in Russia. And so we went like crisis to crisis, understanding how each event, politically driven in many cases or economically driven in some others, had an impact on capital markets, right? And that was super interesting, really, really useful because I, I, I literally, the day I started to work at Eurasia Group, I started to use the tools that I learned in that class. For instance, the Argentina crisis, the bondholders, I don't know if you remember that this, this, this what happened a few years ago. Um, so, so that's one. And the other one, it depends on the region that the fo you focus, but for instance, energy classes, I think are really useful. Uh, understanding how the energy sector works, because it's so important for many economies. I, I, I'm mostly covering Mexico right now, but in Latin America, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, and not, uh, not to say Venezuela, the energy sector is extremely important. So understanding how the dynamics in a sector that is, they impacts the fiscal accounts, the government and the economy overall so importantly, and how that is so tied to politics, not only locally, but globally, it's, 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 really, it's a really cool, uh, good toolkit to have. Yeah, so we have, we have this, our global economic governance class is a lot like your emerging capital markets mm -hmm. class. We learn a lot about crises, <laughs> so, because crises are what makes the world go round. So, so Nora, when you studied at, in, in London, when, did that prepare you for it? Is that sort of the, the secret sauce, or was it was it an internship or the previous set of jobs? How did you get here? Thank you. This is usually my most favorite question in any any talk. I wasn't very organized to begin with during my undergrad years. I had enrolled for an engineering degree, which I found extremely difficult. I think for, the, for me, the turning point was enrolling for a social science class back at my university in Bangladesh, which was gender and international development. And the way that course was designed is that we had to do um, a lot of field work and produce a term paper at, at the end of the semester. Uh, for me, I think that course, if I look back, um, six, seven years from now, that was the turning point for me. I think the realization that it's important to choose a degree where you're not miserable every single day of your life is mm -hmm. extremely important, mm -hmm. and I cannot stress enough upon that factor. If something is a tripping point, either find a solution, or it's always, um, I think, a smart thing to do to, to just turn back, rethink, reflect, and see uh, which setting is most comfortable for you. 
for me, that worked out very well. And I knew from then on that social science um, is, uh, is an area that I was interested in. And I switched my degree to PPE, which is politics, philosophy, and economics. Um, after that, I think just switching that degree just gave me a lot of time outside the classroom. And I was doing a community service with slum children. And I grew deeply attached to, to that, basically. Um, it was every Saturday going and teaching a bunch of um, children English and basic mathematics. Uh, that's when I realized that's what I enjoyed doing the most, which brought me to my first job, which was with a nonprofit organization. A lot of people do not know about it, but I encourage you to look at it. Currently, it is the number one, number one NGO in the world in terms of the number of people it reaches out to. Uh, founded in Bangladesh, but currently BRAC operates in more than 14 countries across the world. Uh, they have a wonderful young, professionals pro young professional program for fresh graduates, which is the program I uh, started off my career with. Deep appreciation and deep love for the program and the kind of exposure it gave me. And I think from there on, it brought me to London, which was a completely different experience because the degree was more technical. And definitely that gave me a lot of clarity, a lot of networking that opened up future doors, which I think is um, should be one of the objectives of a graduate school degree. At SOAS, I think what helped me the most was having a regional specialization. So my first degree was more generic, and like economics could be anything and everything. Um, I think one of the challenges of studying economics is either people expect you to have questions um, have answers to questions from a crisis at the central bank to uh, a lot of microeconomic issues, and I think that's one of the challenges of economics. Um, and at SOAS, it was regional specialization that I did for the South Asian region, so looking at a lot of macroeconomic development issues in the South Asian region, and the only reason I chose South Asia was that's where I come from, and that's a region I know the most. Um, and. I think it was classes at SOAS and the economic, uh, econometric tools that really equipped me for the job I later on took at the World Bank because it focuses a lot on data and to knowing the quantitative tools that you can use for, for analysis. If you don't like that, there's good news because um, UNDP or the UN in general, I mean, there are agencies that are more data heavy in the kind of work that they do. But if someone doesn't like quantitative work, you don't have to force yourself through those classes. But you do have to take it here. <laughs> yeah. I recommend you to take it seriously, though. It comes to some good use, and it looks really fancy on your resume. So, uh, so just take those classes seriously. Um, at the UN, what I currently do is a lot of policy research work, again, with developing countries, and it's not very data heavy. Um, so there is hope after all. Any questions that you have, I'm happy to respond to. <laughs> So how did I get here? Yes. Um, so my, I might have the most nonlinear, um, <laughs> the most nonlinear trajectory. Um, so I was just thinking about you were talking about being a journalist. So my grandfather was a journalist um, at, at the in the Seattle PI, um, and kind of I think always sort of inculcated a broad view of the world. Um, and so I, I think that for me, I always had an interest in international affairs. Um, and uh, I think I took a trip to San Francisco when I was like 19 or something and saw the UN Declaration of Human Rights on the, uh, uh, you know, on the sort of ground near the UN building there. And that was super inspiring to me. Um, I, took a, I took a number of classes that, um, that really kind of, kind of informed uh, my values um, around, primarily like around international human rights law. Um, a class on, um, like a combination class on um, food security and, uh, and um, development um, that also really inspired me. Um, I also volunteered uh, with IRC in Seattle many years back before I even thought of it as a place that I would end up working. Um, and I think that, uh, that all of those experiences led to where I, where I am now. Um, probably, um, probably the thing that, um, probably the thing, I was thinking about like what, what, 
Wh where did I get? I, you know, I, I thought that I would probably be an African regional uh, person. I took a lot of African studies classes. Um, that's kind of where a lot of people end up focused in, in development and uh, in humanitarian work. Um, but my first um, kind of post somewhere else was in the Middle East. And, and I just took it because that was, that was just something that came up and it was an opportunity. And then I think back about opportunities that happened. And the reality is, is that I just said yes to a lot of things um, and said, you know what, I'll just try this and see where it goes. And I ended up learning a lot more than I would have if I had planned <laughs> just, by, just by going forward with it. Um, so that would be, you know, one of the things that I, 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 I recommend is just trying to say yes to as many things as you can um, and just find those things that are, that are interesting to you. Um, that and data. <laughs> <laughs> data is everywhere now um, and it's very important even to an organization like, like mine where we're trying to really understand um, the impact that we have in the world um, and everything from our operations and human resources to the actual impact of our, you know, health and education and livelihoods programs. Uh, so, yeah. So, Olivia, you are the most recently hired I person. <laughs> most your previous job was an internship. It was. And you've gone from internship to like going to go to places and decide who gets money. <laughs> so how'd you get from, from, from there to there? Luck, but also, <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I think my path wasn't necessarily linear. I actually, I'm Canadian originally, and I you know, studied political science in my undergraduate degree, and then actually wound up working in construction, not actually building things, but <laughs> on the management side. Um, I had always had a passion for um, international development and this area of study. And so when I came to New York, I sort of told myself that I would really focus on school, but also really focus on networking and getting great internships. And so I was really fortunate that I was able to intern at the International Crisis Group, which has um, actually its head office is in Brussels and the New York office, which is focused solely on UN advocacy, um, only has about seven full-time staff and then there are seven full-time interns. And so as an intern there, you're expected to work 40 hours per week, um, you know, five days a week, even if you have classes. And so I was in school full-time and doing this full-time, which was absolutely insane. And I wouldn't recommend it necessarily, but it did, um, you know, help me, one, bolster my resume, um, but also, two, it, it actually is what led to me getting um, a job at American Jewish World Service. So I think um, in terms of, like, non-academic side of things, I would really stress that it's terribly important to not be afraid to reach out to people in your networks that you know, to ask them to do things like informational interviews with you, to reach out to people who you might be connected with even through friends of friends or acquaintances if you see a job posting somewhere that they might work. Um, I think it's one of those things that you sort of tell yourself it's deeply uncomfortable and you don't want to do it, um, but it really does make the difference and especially in a city like New York where it is incredibly competitive and this field is just generally very competitive. I think you know a willingness to say yes to opportunities but also a willingness to reach out to people that you might not otherwise think to reach out to is really crucial. Um, in terms of the academic side of things, so the, the program that I went to at a university downtown that I won't mention um, was really fantastic in terms of its approach to um, the program, making things really pragmatic and, and practical. So um, a lot of the courses, as I'm sure is the case here, are taught by practitioners themselves, people with a lot of field experience. You know, I find being in those classes and asking the questions about their experiences was really helpful. The other thing, which might seem a little bit silly and, and maybe mundane, but um, I took a bunch of writing courses in graduate school, which was really, really I crucial. didn't pay her to say this. <laughs> <laughs> which was which was really really crucial um, and has been really phenomenal in terms of helping me to advance in my current role. Um, I can't stress it enough. Like even though it might not seem as exciting and not as sexy as, as other courses that might be offered, it it is it makes a world of difference. So um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. No problem. <laughs> so somebody walks into your offices and they have a new and shiny degree from a fine school, what are you looking at? What do you want to see on that resume in addition to that master's degree? What do you want to know? You want to maybe you see an internship someplace. 
do you want to know that they took particular courses? Are you going to, do you want to know that if they did stats, they had a particular form of stats? Do you want to know, you know what is it that you're, you're looking for? Do you want to know what they wrote their capstone on? You know, what, what is it beyond the fact that you've got a master's degree from a good school? Anybody, jump in. Um, I think it's all of those things. I, I also think it's really important, especially in this job market, to reference um, skills in terms of writing and, and data collection. So whether you've taken a stats class or whatever um, software programs you're proficient in. I also think it's really important to reference any courses that you've take, taken or projects that you've worked on that sort of showcase your critical thinking abilities. I think that's something really crucial. And I know, you know, in the most recent um, series of interviews that I've sat on the other side of, that's been something that we've really looked for in candidates and sort of knowing that people can be responsive and adaptive and think on their feet. Um, can, because can, can I interrupt you? Yeah. How, how does one showcase one's critical thinking ability? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think a lot of that comes from questions sort of around like, name a time that you've messed up in a job and how you corrected that or, um, you know, what's a way that you've worked on a group project and problem solved, sort of areas like that. I think it's really important to showcase those skills. And even if you are fresh out of graduate school and you maybe have a really limited, um, number of, of job experiences, even just a, a handful of resumes, I think it's really crucial to even reference times where you've done group assignments in graduate school um, and how you've you know, pulled together a group that may not have agreed with everything that everyone wanted to do. Silly things like that maybe that are actually really, really important and I think most employers would be really interested um, to hear that. Interesting, anybody else? Somebody walks in, Nora? Oh, well, I was going to second the writing. Um, the writing. I think that um, in this kind of in this kind of work, communication skills are really important, um, and we do actually um, test on writing when we oh. have new, especially especially newly graduated um, students. Um, we will will actually like have them give us a writing sample as well as like look through, critically analyze something, and correct issues with it. Just because. Just because that's so important, we do so much writing communications that we need to make sure that we are starting from a level of, of competency. Um, I think that the you know critical critical thinking and when you're interviewing in a critical thinking sort of atmosphere um, is really just being able to you know answer questions that are of, on a wide variety of topics, um, but also being able to showcase by talking about the things that are in interesting to you and you really using those questions to kind of to work forward with a platform for yourself. So not just always answering exactly what you think the interviewee wants to know, but also what you want to tell them about your experience and about how you think that experience will, um, uh, you know, work with the organization that you're talking to or the interviewee that you're talking to. So really using those questions as an opportunity uh, more than just a, a answering the question that they've asked. Um, yeah, um, I also second uh, what the panel is talking about in with respect to writing skills. Um, at the UN as well, when we do um, selection of candidates, we do have um, a particular test that we uh, require candidates to take where we assess writing skills. So usually the way it's done is uh, we provide an article and we want an analysis. So essentially I think what's critical for my job is we're not looking for people who can only summarize a particular topic. Uh, what we're looking for and that's where we really look into critical thinking skills is what value addition or have you been able to critically dissect the main arguments in the paper? Have you been able to come up with um, a, a thorough analysis and provide something, a, a very new argument to, to what's being presented? And uh, I think that's very, very important um, in the job that, um, any job that you, rec uh, that you apply for, especially in this discipline. And I think the second thing in competency-based interview, which uh, is what the practice that is followed at the United Nations, is attention to detail. Um, and in most of the interview panels that I have sat through, uh, sometimes candidates have differed by a point or a half a point or two points. And I think um, what we usually give a lot of um, credit to is does the candidate have a 
attention to detail and the way sometimes we measure it is it even when we're doing a Skype interview, have you, uh, some candidates actually jot down the names of the panelists and thank each panelist by name at the end of the interview. That's usually a good tip. It shows that you're an active listener, that you've actually um, made it a point to not only listen to the names, but also write it down that you've done some background work on the team and the department that you've applied for because of course uh, the name of the staff are also in the in the website so these are very little things but I think these are also things that come with practice and I think if there is graduate school is also a good time to jot down what would be your first three preferences in, t in terms of the job that you want to land also go for any and all interviews that you get called for because uh, it helps you prepare for the job that you really, really want. So don't just expect that you'll walk into an interview board and totally ace it. Um, take it seriously, look at, look at their website, look at their strategic framework if they have one or an annual report that gives you a lot of insights uh, on what, what is expected or the kind of work that the particular department does. And the third advice that I have is um, try and develop a niche for yourself. And if you can do that during the course of your graduate studies, I think that helps you a great deal. For example, if you know you want to work in uh, technology or the creative economy, it's probably a good idea to have a lot of knowledge on blockchain or art artificial intelligence. And how do you demonstrate that is not just by taking courses. Have you actually done some research papers while you were at school is usually a good indicator for us. In most of the interviews that we've done in the past um, year and a half that I've been with the UN, we have actually recruited a lot of candidates where we saw that this candidate has working knowledge or has some research knowledge uh, in South-South Cooperation or has a regional specialization because we do have regional offices in Africa, in Middle East and uh, the Asia Pacific region. So we require candidates to have some sort of added knowledge. And I think that uh, helps distinguish you from the rest of the candidates that are applying. So yeah, developing a niche is, is key. Thanks. To, to that point of developing a niche, I think that I would, I would go also to this next level, which is develop an intersection of two niches, of two topics, because in this world that we live in, you have tons of experts in economics, and you have tons of experts in a country, and you have tons of experts on, on these single issues. But if you're capable of bringing two things together and give that other layer of special specialization, I think that it will differentiate you from others. And even maybe you're an IT expert, but you are also interested in international affairs. In my case, it was political science, economics, and a region of Mexico, Etc. So, so giving that like a deeper specialization with two, at least two topics, I think it helps out significantly. And back to the question, to the things that we, what we look for when, when we're interviewing someone, etc. Basically, the, the interview uh, interviewing process, how it works at the Eurasia Group, is the very straightforward. Are verbal interviews, several of them. You you talk to many members of the team and also members of the business development team, et cetera, and also a written test. Uh, for my case specifically, how it worked was, as I said, many conversations, and the written test was uh, two questions specifically on current issues on Mexican politics, which is the job that I was going to develop. So I had to showcase in an hour what I could write rather quickly because that's the type of turnaround that we need for clients, et cetera. Uh, Writing skills are really important then. And, and, and when you're interviewing these people, where you're reading these, 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 these arguments, you're looking for that part of solid political analysis plus how you connect the dots between your clients and what's going on politically. So that, that combination, again, of, of, of skills is, is, I think, what we are looking for in people when they, they work at that, that my company. Yeah. So do you all have interns in your offices? Yes? And so... Is it posted internships, or do people, is it in a particular period of time, or and are you looking for the same thing, the same sort of skill sets that you're talking about for, for, for jobs as well? Uh, maybe I can start. Um, it, it depends. Uh, it's a little bit disorganized in that sense in my company, to be completely honest. For some positions during the summer or for some areas, they advertise it like on their website, et cetera. For others, 
is more just someone needs help uh, from a practice at the China team, like they need more people helping out on doing research, etc. So they start to look for people that they don't really advertise it. So what I would recommend is, as, as they were saying before, just knock the door and maybe the door will open. And if it doesn't open there, it might open in another place. So, so at least in my company, since it's not the most structured process, I would just be asking for, for possibilities. I was in a panel at Columbia last semester, and one of the students asked me, like, who should he reach if there's an opportunity there? Uh, uh, he was Chinese, an expert in China. And I told him, like, send an email to the Chinese, China expert. And two months later, I saw him at the office working there for the summer. So uh, it worked. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. I'm not so, but yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. We do post for certain internships, but most of it is on an ad hoc basis. A lot of uh, graduates just reach out to out to us, especially through LinkedIn. And trust me, that, that really, really works. And um, I really encourage you to um, search people with similar profiles um, and that match your interest set, basically. Reach out to them, ask requests for internships. Um, and we do recruit most of our interns like that. Like, we have a chat with them through LinkedIn, and if we have, we do have busy seasons, which is usually the fall season for us, when we have a number of uh, interns who come and basically work for us. Interesting. Um, yeah, we have, we post inter internships on our website when they are available. Um, they're usually always available, um, and there there's a specific need usually during summer months and fall months. We usually post uh, our internships online, um, but we unfortunately only do summer internship programs, um, but they are really well structured um, and at times actually give interns the opportunity to travel internationally. Ooh, that sounds cool. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to them. Is there anything else that I neglected to ask you guys that you think that sh they should be thinking about? I have one. Yes. <laughs> I think what everyone in every career talk will tell you is basically what we've spoken about. But from my experience and people who have inspired me um, in the past few years, I think what's really, really important is, um, of course, to fit into the framework and make sure you have the right attitude, that you're proactive, that you have the right skill set for the job. But I think what's important is also to uh, stick to who you are as a person, because I think every individual brings something new to the team in terms of um, your political views, in terms of the region uh, that you come from. And I think um, as much as assimilation is important, it's also very, very important to hold on to those values, to hold on to your opinions. And I think that's what the world lacks, and it would be my wish that um, at the workplace you're, you don't change as a person. University is usually a place where uh, it's an intellectual environment, and no, no one's too shy to actually flag their political views. Uh, as much as the world might tell you you should fit into a box, I. I differ, and I think you should take your unique set to any interview that you walk into. Um, so I've had a couple of interns, and I work with a lot of people at the organization that I work at. Um, and I would say that this is more, I guess, after you've gotten through the door. Um, the I can't stress enough how how just good working skills and working habits are important to us. Um, and Im important to our organization as a whole and important just to, just to our own growth and development inside um, the organization. So everything from you know being proactive and following up on emails and just being um, just basically having a positive attitude and trying to work with with people that are different and sometimes not having a positive attitude, those things go so far. Um, in our organization. So if you have, you know, a couple of people and one person is not happy and another person is a little bit more happy, then it's going to be easier um, for the happier person to get along with, uh, with, with, the, with sort of the difficulties and vicissitudes of the organization. Because a lot of times these, this kind of work is difficult. Um, we don't all know exactly what we need to do at any given time. And so we have to work together to understand that. In order to work together, we have to kind of you know, push ourselves and push those sort of soft skills uh, to make it to make it work. 
Um, so I would just I would I would recommend thinking about like our how our work habits um, affect those around us and how they improve our own growth and development. Um, I think I would also say that it's so so important and it's kind of shocking that this even has to be stressed. But do your research before an interview. Spend some time on the organization's website. Familiarize yourself with their mission, with their core programming. Um, it's so important and you'd be surprised by the number of people who come to interviews and it, it's clear they have no idea what the organization's even mission is. Um, I think to that aim too, it's really, really important to come prepared with a couple of, of good follow-up questions to ask at the end of an interview. I don't think any interviewer ever wants to hear, no, I have no questions, thank you so much. I think it's always really great and again, another way to showcase that you've you know paid attention to the the website and you're familiar with the work to ask, um, you know, one or two really pointed follow-up questions. Yeah. Proofread. <laughs> <laughs> How important is that? You get an email that's not grammatical. You get a resume that's got something spelled wrong on it. I'm obsessed with this. <laughs> I, you know, it's not just because I have the soul of a copy editor, but I do, I do think it says something. It's that attention to detail issue. And, you know, I say this to my students all the time. Show somebody else your resume. Show somebody else your email before you send out. You don't write an email to somebody for a job the way you would write an email to your mother. You don't write an email to a professor the way you would write an email <laughs> to your mother. And return your emails. I know you guys, your generation doesn't actually communicate by email, but you know what? The work world still communicates by email. So all of those things, if you don't reply to an email quickly, they're gonna go on to the next person. Mm -hmm. They really are. They're not gonna be communicating with you by text or by Snapchat, or by Instagram, or by all the other normal ways that, that everybody else communicates. And I know this because I have a 24-year-old, but nevertheless, they're gonna be communicating with you by email. And so it's retro as it is. Um, so all of those things seem, I mean, these are sort of basic hygiene things, and hygiene is really essential. And I will tell you that I had somebody who interviewed for a job on the edit page of the Times who seemed to really want the job, and we brought this person up from, who was a, quite a well-known journalist, and brought this person up from Washington. And at the end of this conversation, we said the obvious question, so critique the edit page for us. What would you like to change you know, on positions or the way we do it? And this person looked at us, and, he's, and he said, you know, I don't read the edit page all that much. Hmm. Was, and on the train back to Washington, he called me, and he said to me, do you think I blew the interview? I was like, oh no, absolutely not. <laughs> it's just, it's that sort of notion of, you've got, you've got to get, you've got to the, give the love out there. You, you probably all are curious about the world and are interested in this field um, by, you know, by just being here and by being in this program. Um, but that you can express that and you can communicate that curiosity and you can talk about it when you're interviewing or when you're working with your colleagues. Um, I mean, that's something also, I mean, you know, we're talking about, you know, asking pointed questions. I mean, what are the, what are the important things to the interviewer or the important things to the organization? That's your opportunity to talk about what you're curious about and what you care about. Mm -hmm. um, the, this copy editing, so we've talked a little bit about writing skills and I think actually it's, it, it, it is writing skills and communication, but at the end of the day, it's really, it is copy editing. It is understanding that it's not just the first draft or the second draft, it might be the third draft. That is the that is the that is the final product, and absolutely, if it's an important communication that's going out to senior management or going out to 300 people in your organization, absolutely get a second set of eyes. You know, even if it's a status report, sometimes we'll we'll have multiple people look at a status report because we we know that when we're reviewing something, we're really likely to miss the, our own errors. Um, even if there's minor typos or we see something last minute that we want to change, chances are I've introduced a new error in there. And you know what? It's probably not that big of a deal, but it does show it, it does show like a, a, a little bit of a lack of care if, if you send it out to um, without without having that review on there. Um, so yeah, I mean I I'll second that one too. The the copy editing skills, um, absolutely. How does somebody find like, how does somebody communicate creativity to you and how important is creativity to you? I think that the creative part might may come from really looking at some 
political event or development through through different perspectives and and through through not just giving out the more the most common answer that you hear from what's going on in the world what's going on in the specific country i think that people that really think about the issues usually have a slightly different view or at least can challenge what the general opinion is and, and it's interesting to uh, many of our clients actually what they want is not for us to predict the future because it's impossible but they want us to help them think in different ways right and 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 challenge the common opinion through smart and well thought arguments uh so so more than being creative and just coming up with some uh very different idea i think i think is this thorough and methodical way of looking at things and and not just staying with what the common belief is on certain specific issues and you know you guys can go on their website and read some of their reports which are out there so to un really understand the sort of work they do some of the stuff is out in public you don't have to pay them the big bucks to get it <laughs> so and I, I encourage my students to look at it because it, it a it shows you how to write critically but b it's also I mean it's really useful stuff there yes there is a a, a weekly post called signal um, is that it's it's super interesting it's fun to read uh, and, and it's about global geopolitics issues that are happening every week so it's it's really good so you should sign up to that <laughs> and how and finally before we do this how do you guys like search people's social media do you pay attention to you know what they're tweeting and 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 what they're saying and do they need to be careful about that i mean you said they have to be themselves so, um on the other hand after trump says what he did at the un you know <laughs> you know their commentary <laughs> might <laughs> You might be dreading the answer to this question. We actually do. We look at LinkedIn profiles very, very seriously, and we do also look at social media profiles. We try not to judge people, but um, I think before we take someone on board, we also try and understand, A, how you're as a person, um, and how well we think you can blend into the, the work environment, because we do not want to bring in someone and then have to ask that person to leave us after a couple of months. Usually we try and get someone who uh, we think will, will is able to work with us uh, for, for a decent amount of time. So um, yeah, do the right things on social media and be <laughs> mindful of what you post. <laughs> yes. I think that maybe um, in the different directions you were saying that come up with your own ideas and views I think that for my, my job specifically, um, the best, not the best, but one thing that you should try to do is to never reveal what your political opinions are. Like I, I obviously have, I, like I provided a political analysis, but to my clients, they can never, in an election for instance, in the end understand whether I support one or the other candidate. I can, I can say that one will win or one has a bigger chance of probability of winning to the other, but if I, if I, after a meeting, they come out saying clearly he's like utterly against this guy or in favor of, of this woman or whatever. I think that, that I, then I made a mistake in the way that I'm, that I'm portraying my analysis. On the social media, it's his challenge. I don't know if you know Ian Bremer. He's the owner of uh, my company and he's super active in social media and he posts all of his views and comments, anti-Trump stuff there. I, I am not very happy with that to be completely honest but if he does it like other people in my company can do it so so that part of the social media is not that important for us he is, I mean, Ian Bremmer's worth following on Twitter he's yes. really really active act, active on it uh, that's one of the reasons I asked the question yeah. so I want to throw it open to you guys um, why don't you give, ask a question stand up and say what you're studying which would be great name and what you're studying would be really useful so Sarah Hello. Hi. Um, I graduated. I'm not studying anything, actually. Uh, and wrote a very good capstone. <laughs> Thank you. I did study policy and also still while I was here. Um, and I guess what I would like all of the panelists to answer is what specifically are you looking for when you apply online? So let's say you don't know anybody, you don't have a connection at the company. What is it that is going to actually get your attention? Is it listing? you know, relevant skills at the top of the resume? Is it writing, providing a writing sample that is relevant to your company? Is it, 
you know, just having a really great cover letter, and if so, what does that consist of? Because it, just from my experience, it's very frustrating to apply online and to not know what you could have done differently. That's a great question. Um, I'll take a first stab at it. Um, so actually, some of the best advice I ever received was around tailoring my resume, as painful as it might be, to specific jobs. And I think it's imperative that you, especially for jobs that you're very passionate about, um, you know, tweaking your resume as needed to reflect the skills that it's clear that they are looking for. Um, and then, of course, writing a cover letter that further showcases that. I think if you can literally integrate some of the language from the job posting into your resume and then of course into your cover letter that goes a very long way in terms of getting you know the initial screening through um, even if you don't know anyone I think that's a really important thing and then of course if you have you know one or two really great writing samples that you can include that's fantastic um, again because you can demonstrate that you um, you know are capable of, of good critical analysis and that you're a strong writer um, I think all of those things would, would put you in a really good position I completely agree with Olivia. Please read the job description very, very seriously. When we write down the terms of reference, usually those are the skills that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, yes, we do make um, some exceptions. For example, if we've put in five years of work experience and the candidate has three years of work experience, but we think that the, it's a solid candidate, we would chances are we would still call you for the interview. What Olivia mentions about um, making sure you tailor make your resume, it's very, very important to have the keywords. For example, if we are recruiting for um, a project that we're doing in South-South Cooperation, it's very likely, and we're looking for someone with five years experience, it's very likely that we require that can candidate to have some knowledge of South-South Cooperation, to have some knowledge of working in a developing country, usually. So pay attention to those details. A second tip that I received and it has worked very well for me. Um, usually with online applications, I've had my fair share of bad luck. What you can consider doing is looking up at that department where you're applying. Look at who the talent acquisition manager is or look at a few candidates um, that you think potentially because usually in, f at least for the UN, we don't mention who the recruiting manager is. So look at certain some people at that department, reach out to them on LinkedIn and um, tell them you've applied mm -hmm. for this job. Mm -hmm. Usually for even an internship, we get sometimes over 100 applications, believe mm -hmm. it or not. And more often, often than not, we are not looking at 100 applications. We are usually looking for a candidate who's gone an added mile to reach out to us or where we've received recommendation from a fellow coworker. Uh, so please try and do the networking, try and do the connection. It, it sounds like a very, very difficult turf, and it is difficult to reach out to someone. Sometimes you'll reach out to 50 people, and maybe you'll be lucky enough to hear back from five people. But those five people have responded with probably the intention to help you out. So reach out to people. Yeah, and I would, oh, sorry. I would, yeah, I would also just pretty much second the, these comments. The, um, you know, some of our least competitive seeming positions, we have over 150 applicants for. Um, so I, I think with tailoring, I mean, imagine that your, that your resume um, and cover letter is getting analyzed by a robot, because most of the time mm -hmm. it is getting analyzed mm -hmm. by a robot, especially for UN agencies. Um, for a lot of organizations, they're, they're just analyzing for keywords. So that will immediately kind of put your resume up to, the, up to the top. Tailoring it so that it is actually telling a story about how your work and educational experience mm -hmm. fits the organization's needs and the position needs is absolutely, um, you know, that, that is resonant with hiring managers. Um, and then also, yeah, I mean, reaching out. The, you know, you might not get contacted by the person that you've reached out to, but you also might get contacted by them and if they know your name then when they're sorting through the resumes or when they're looking for the res through the resumes they'll actually name you and that means that they'll pay extra attention to your resume so it just gives you a little bit of an added edge over the you know the other resumes that are just being scanned through that you know I mean that's that's the weight that it is I mean it's it's kind of it's a little bit it, I mean, I think it's a good thing to know just that people will respond back. Um, we've talked about this a little bit. You know, reaching out to people cold um, seems super scary, but oftentimes people 
are there and they will um, mm -hmm. respond back to you and talk to you, give you an informational interview or review your resume a little in a little bit more detail. Hi, my name is Benjamin. I am with the MPA program specializing in uh, sustainability and urban development. Um, firstly, thank you all for coming and speaking with us. Uh, my question is much broader, uh, and it goes for the entire panel. The reason I joined this program was because I wanted a career that uh, has some kind of impact in, in the world, uh, not just to make money, right? So if I can ask each of the panelists, what do you hope that your careers, how would you like your careers to impact uh, you know, the wider community or the wider world, et cetera, so that I can have some frame of mind how when I'm finished with my program, I might want to, want to take that, that direction. So thank you. Sure. <laughs> um, no, I, I think no one goes into this field for the money. So <laughs> it's really good. Um, it's important to be motivated by the work. And I think something for me that's, that's made a world of difference is, is going to the field. Um, so actually, I spent quite a bit of time in Bangladesh with BRAC um, several months ago. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, I think seeing the work on the ground and, and if you can, working with an organization whose mission you are deeply aligned with. And so I think, you know, I'm really fortunate that so early on in my career, I've wound up at an organization where I wholeheartedly ascribe to the mission and the work that they do. And, and now I can't imagine myself working with groups other than, you know, small grassroots collectives, mostly led by women, you know, focusing on feminist issues and, you know, access to justice. These are all things that are really important to me. So I think in terms of measuring the impact of that work and what I hope to do, I think probably more of that and to a greater extent, something that is really important to me is I think encouraging other organizations that are maybe even more well-resourced than the one that I work for to adopt a similar model and to work with these you know, very marginalized groups um, from all over the world that maybe aren't accessing funding to not just give them the resource, the financial resources um, to do their work, but also to focus on capacity building for them and to give them, you know, the actual tools that they need to advance the causes that they work on. Um, so everything from advocacy to grant writing to, you know, networking them and connecting them with other organizations in the region that are doing similar work. I think that is so important, and that's something that I really hope to do more of as my career progresses. Um, uh, so I, uh, I mentioned that I had volunteered at, with the IRC in Seattle and uh, my, my role was a family, a family mentor and what I did was basically worked with a newly resettled refugee from Eritrea who was an unaccompanied minor and I basically just went to his house and um, hung out with him, um, got him set up with a bank account and helped figure out the public transportation and that sort of thing. Um, and, I, and I realized uh, then that I really, I really liked this, like making a difference in other people's lives. Um, and even throughout my working career in um, for profits, I mean, what I, what I enjoyed really was actually like making things um, helping people to achieve their goals. Um, at the IRC, I've been really fortunate to work across a number of different um, parts of the organization to, to move our strategic agenda forward, but also to like make an impact directly to our beneficiaries and to say, you know, with this program that we implemented, we were actually able to achieve something that we weren't able to achieve before. Um, I do think that you know, for for what I what I'm doing and um, what Olivia is doing is like these are really mission driven organizations, um, nonprofits, NGOs, foundations that have um, really a social impact as part of their core mission, um, and that's that's definitely a motivating factor for me. Um, yeah, completely agree with what um, has already been said. And I think a qu a question I would like to throw at all of you is to ask yourself how you define impact for yourself, because I think it differs from an individual to an individual. Um, having started my career with BRAC, of course, with a very, very strong mission to reaching out to the underserved, that's a mission I think uh, anyone and everyone feels like they connect to. 
uh, coming from there to an organization like the UN, which is also highly political in the kind of work that it does, highly bureaucratic, I think um, is I've also met a lot of people who get frustrated in the system. I'm probably still new, so I'm not frustrated yet. I don't know what will become of my career in, in the next decade or so. But I think for now, uh, the way I look at impact is, um, is on a very micro level. On a micro level, what I go to work for every day, um, I think when I came into this job, I uh, really didn't know, to be honest, uh, what what exactly I'll be engaged with. I've been very fortunate in working very closely with the government of Bangladesh, although I'm uh, based in New York and that's Bangladesh is where I come from. And I think for me, the impact is also trying to help out my country and trying to really um, being able to facilitate projects, being able to mobilize funds and resources to promote South-South cooperation in Bangladesh. And I think for, for me at this point, uh, what I take, um, a lot of um, interest and passion in is helping out underdeveloped countries to make sure that uh, that they really are able to use and align to the to the framework that we work with. Uh, of course, things are not always perfect because there is the 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 whole politics that also surrounds international development, and I think you need to be aware of that. Things don't always work the way it's laid out in, in a project document. And I think that's where sometimes in your career you will question yourself and you will ask yourself w what the added value is to doing what you're doing. And I think the, the question, the challenge for you to address is to ask yourself what, what does impact mean to you and uh, what, it, what is it that you want to achieve. And uh, for the very early stages of your career, I think uh, a good approach is also to see what else can you take from the organization that you're still working for? As long as you haven't reached your point of saturation, it is my personal view that you're still taking a lot in from the organization and uh, that in itself is reason enough for you to stay. Of course, as long as it's still aligned to your interests and what you want to achieve in life. So I want a, a full-throated defense of the private sector here. Because <laughs> exactly. I, I don't want every one of these students to go out and work in an NGO or an IG. There's also the private sector. <laughs> yes, I'm, I, I was going to say that I'm the bad guy at the panel here. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, oh, like, it's, it's my, my company and what we do has no, like, public service objective. Like, we provide services to the private companies that want to make money and want to bring money to their, like, boards and the people that invest in them, right? So so in that regard, we are not looking for that objective of making a, a direct impact to the world in a, in a positive way to say it somehow. But that doesn't mean that you personally cannot do it on your own time and that the company also fosters that, working on social services, et cetera, which is a, a completely different goal. And, and it's also, and this might be more, um, esoteric or stretch the band a little bit of what we do, but trying to help out people understand how po politics work, how the government works, and, and how, how the geopolitics work in general serves some kind of service and purpose, uh, but yeah, in the end, it's, it's all profit-driven. It's <laughs> but it's also not something that you do necessarily for your whole life because people move, you came from the government into this work, you may b go back and serve another government, you may run for president, who knows, <laughs> not here, but maybe in Mexico. Um, but you know, there's, these, are, these are jobs that also, you, know, you take them one step and you know, they're all different you know, life experiences and learning experiences. Yeah, and, and, uh, and as I said, you can do both things at the same time. Like, you have free time still when you work and you can still try to like give something back to society and but not at work <laughs> right and contribute to baruch also <laughs> so <laughs> another question and we're coming down to sort of final jeopardy so do not ask every panelist to just let's to, we'll sort of throw because we got several questions okay i'll go so we'll get a recording of it uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Ogo Silla. I'm an MIA student in the uh, INGO uh, concentration. And I guess I'd like to ask um, uh, when, dur during the interview process, the face-to-face -face interview, 
what exactly would you say, um, uh, 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 Daniel Kaufman, uh, I want to ask you, especially because you worked a lot in communication, that myself formerly was a journalist. In an interview like that, how, what is the importance, I guess, of uh, of the candidate's smile? Like, does that stick out? <laughs> is it because sometimes you might expect the person to be like a scared little rabbit, and uh, does smiling and looking comfortable make a difference in you remembering that candidate? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, I think obviously if you, um, if you come into an interview with um, uh, you're, you know, self-assured and confident that that will make a difference. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to um, suggest or advocate for arrogance or, or like overconfidence, um, but definitely being self-assured um, and being comfortable with yourself is important. Um, there, yeah, I don't think anybody wants to be a scared rabbit or, or interview a scared rabbit. I think, uh, I think having, a, having a reasonable smile and, and being self-assured is good. Although a glass of wine before the interview, perhaps not. <laughs> <laughs> After we'll be fine. Um, <laughs> next question. Okay. Hi, my name is Angelina. I'm a new MPA student here, but I have a background in peace and conflict studies, Middle East, and anyways, I won't give my resume, but um, I was looking over the IRC's um, career job site, the, the job site, and it kind of looked like to me that there was more of an emphasis on tactile skills than it was on a regional focus. Um, and I'm kind of in the in in that transitional period where I'd like to get a, a great internship that I'm either focusing in school on you know the Middle East or I'm focusing on administrative or educational work. For me, peace building work, you know, is across the board. That's my passion. So I don't necessarily feel like I'm married to a specific um, tactile skill at this point. So I'd just like your opinion as to what you're looking for in that. I mean, it can anyone can answer that, but thank you. I, I can be pretty pretty quick about that. We don't. Um, so we do have regions where we operate, but we don't do um, a major focus on regional competencies. I mean, that is a great skill to have. Um, but for particular um, regions, we'll oftentimes be tr looking for like a larger um, percentage of national staff in those regions. Um, and then what we do is we have broad-based technical areas of focus. So education, economic development, health, and those sorts of areas, um, which oftentimes you'll find people moving between. So you may grow up in health, but then move into economic development, unless you're a doctor or a, you know you have a PhD in public health or something like that. But those sectors, oftentimes, people will move through. So there is a little bit more of a focus, especially at the, at the sort of HQ level, on the technical focus. Um, and then the regional focus would be more if you are actually working in a particular country program as opposed to an advisor or like a policy advisor or a technical advisor. Sure. Thank you. And then you. Uh, hi, my name is Deepika Shrasta, and I'm from Nepal. Uh, my question is, uh, so in the path of career, as you reach one level, maybe this is your dream, dream job that you're doing right now. So at this point of time, what is your next step? What is your next dream step? Thank you. <laughs> uh, Finally, yeah. the first female secretary general of the <laughs> UN. <laughs> it's about time. Um, <laughs> what? No, God, no. <laughs> I can't deal with bureaucracies. Um, that's a very, very difficult question. Uh, when I studied economics and political sciences, the job I wanted is a job with the United Nations. Um, now that I'm at this job, and um, I mean, people who I look up to for mentorship, and I think the more I talk to them, the more I hear about that, their experiences, I think uh, what I would be happiest doing is learn all the technical skills that I need to from, from the HQ here, understand the politics of international development, and then um, I'm back to the region that I come from. Because I think if you want to be a development practitioner, mm -hmm. we are not needed here, not so many of us. I think um, there is no escaping the fact that you have to go to the regions that need development practitioners. We need to be in Sudan and Afghanistan and Bangladesh and Nepal, and not all of us are needed here in New York. I, it, this can be taken care of, and I think, uh, 
ultimately years down the line, that's that's where I see myself. Interesting. What's so your dream? I think the moral of the story is dreams change. <laughs> What's yours? In my case, I, I really love what I do. Um, but as my career progresses, I think that the goal is to develop in the in the business of it, right? It's, it's, it's not just doing political analysis, it's understanding how to sell to clients, how to engage with m a bigger stakeholders, uh, to continue to step ahead. Um, in the past, I used to think, when I, I worked in government in Mexico, then public, the private sector, then here, private sector again, um, and, and in, in, in my mind was to go back to Mexico at some point, to work in government again, like build my network in the country. But like coming to New York, it really opened up to me like the world significantly. And, and just looking at it beyond Mexico, beyond just like the, that path on public affairs, uh, I, th I think that, that opened it up significantly. So I think this is just like going deeper into the business, what I'm, I'm aiming, aiming to do right now. Um, I think dreams do change. Um, I would say that I um, am increasingly interested in the advocacy side of the work that I do. Um, and so honing those skills is something that I'm really interested in doing and would really love the opportunity to be more dedicated to advocacy, either UN or USG advocacy. Um, I think that's a really interesting skill set to develop um, and something that I would be keen to do. So nobody ever says they wanted to be a bureaucrat when they grow <laughs> up. Um, but I actually, so I've, I've recently, in the last couple of years, become more of a, of a manager of people that do my job, uh, which, is, which is really interesting. Um, I, I did have a dream job where I was able to build systems and software and, and design things and be kind of a maker. And then recently, well, a couple of years ago, started managing people doing that. And, um, and it, at first, it was a little bit of a challenge, but then it became my dream uh, as I learned more about how to do it better. Um, but yeah, I, I think dreams change. <laughs> a question for Ms. Green. Uh, a question for Ms. Green. <laughs> I have a great um, Your policy analyst, so what does that mean? What do you do on a daily basis? Thank you. <laughs> that is one difficult, very difficult <laughs> question. Uh, what it is, is it that we do? Um, so the work of my department, which is the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation, we do a lot of policy and intergovernmental work, which means um, we work with governments. And in the area that we work with governments, we try and make sure that the, not make sure, we try and advocate for South-South Cooperation and the integration of South-South Cooperation in the national development frameworks of, of countries. And our uh, role from the policy side is to do cutting edge, to do and also to support cutting edge research on South-South Cooperation. Uh, basically, because this is an international development cooperation framework that is relatively new, we invest a lot of resources in developing frameworks for measurement and evaluation of South-South Cooperation, in mobilizing funds from different regions of the world to facilitate those projects. And I think where our role comes in is um, mediating these two things, uh, identifying where the resource, resources and the funding can come from and then identifying needs of different regions and trying to match this. And the second thing that we do from a policy perspective is to inform practices of governments, is to inform policy, to develop new policy instruments that can facilitate and take forward this framework. I hope that was clear. I'm happy to chat with you further. This is usually a very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Amadeo. Uh, so currently, this is my second semester in MIA program. So I'm actually um, I'm currently working as a Spanish English interpreter. Um, however, as I continue with this career, I started with internships. I started to work with an um, uh, NGO that works with the UN, the uh, Vivat International. I also did, uh, I was working for this two-week event at the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues at the UN, which was on last April. 
So these two experiences made me think I could not just work as a translator or interpreter, but I could also be part of this team, part of those teams working for developing programs, for making uh, life of people better. Um, so for s this question will be for Daniel and Nora, probably. Uh, so for someone with my skills, my experience, but also limited experience in this new career, um, what uh, suggestions would you provide? For example, the human, uh, re um, Rescue Humanitarian Committed, one place I, I was looking at, same with developing program at the UN. Um, so, I mean, so right now there is actually um, quite a bit of, of humanitarian activity happening um, in Central and South America. Um, I, the, you know, the one, when programs like that are starting up, there, there's oftentimes really just a need uh, for committed and skilled people. Um, and if you have an interest in that area, I would actually just recommend reaching out um, to talk to the people that are starting up those programs. Uh, there's programs in Colombia, there's programs in Guatemala, there's programs um, in Venezuela uh, that are all right now nascent and developing um, because there's international interest in, in supporting the humanitarian um, action in those areas. Um, thank you. I think um, it's great that you've had that experience and I think moving forward what you can do is do some uh, thorough research on exactly what at the UN you would like you would like to do because the UN also has like an endless number of UN agencies focusing on different issues. Uh, a lot of people that we get usually who have uh, again a regional understanding or is proficient in one of the official languages of the UN that is usually a very very good skill to have since you've been doing translation work to be able to marry that with um, particular experience in, in policy or uh, in any other field that you want to work for, I would look at the Regional Bureau for Latin American Countries, uh, which looks, which basically requires candidates to, to be proficient in, um, in Spanish, but don't restrict yourself to that as it, well. Yes. Just do your research, reach out to teams, and I would start with trying and getting an internship. I think that that's your gateway. Okay. Thank you. Well, I want to thank every you guys for coming. It's been great, really interesting, and thank you all for coming. And you can start knocking on lots of doors now. And for my students who have their annotated bibliographies due this weekend, that's the sort of <laughs> critical thinking they are looking for. So thank you all. Thank you, Marty and Suzanne, for putting this together. Thank you.